patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Peace be to you who have read.
especially our God, Lord, and Father, and our God, and Theodore, our priest, Lord Peter, and Stanislav, and that they be forgiven all their transgressions, whether committed voluntarily or involuntarily. Again, we pray that the Lord our God will establish their souls for the righteous repose, for the mercies of God, the kingdom of heaven, for the forgiveness of their transgressions. Let us ask of Christ our Lord and King and our God. For you are the resurrection, the life, and the repose of your servants who have fallen asleep, O Christ our God. And we offer glory to you, together with your Father, who is God beginning, your all holy, good, and life giving spirit, now and ever, and to the ages of ages. Grant eternal repose and bless the sleep, O Lord, to the souls of your servants who have fallen asleep, and make their memory to be eternal. Accept our prayer, O God. Make us worthy to bring you prayers, supplications, and other sacrifice for all your people. Enable us, whom you have placed by the power of your Holy Spirit, in this your priestly ministry, without reproach and without blame, in testimony of a pure conscience, to call on you at all times and places, so that hearing us, you will be merciful to us in the multitude of your goodness. For to you are you all glory, honor, and worship, to the Father, and to the Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever, and to the ages of ages. Without change and without alteration, 
you became man and made yourself our high priest. And as master of all, you charged us with the serving this liturgical and blood of sacrifice. For only you, O Lord our God, reigned over the heavenly and earthly beings. You were carried on the throne of the cherubim. O Lord of the seraphim, the King of Israel, only you are holy and rest among the holy. I therefore pray to you, O Lord, our good and ready to hear. Look upon me, your servant, a sinner and a useless man, and cleanse my soul and my heart from any trace of a bad conscience. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, make me, who am clothed with the grace of the priesthood, dominate to stand before this your Holy Spirit, and to sacrifice your Holy Spirit body and flesh and blood. For I come to you bowing my head, and I pray, do not turn your face from me, nor reject me from among your priests. For count me as worthy, so that these gifts will be brought by me, your sinful and worthy servant. For you are he who brings, and he who is brought, he who receives, and he who is received by Christ my Father. And we offer glory to you together with your Father, who is without beginning, with your all holy, good, and life of your spirit, now and ever.
invisible, incomprehensible, ever existing, and existing ever the same. You and your only begotten Son and your Holy Spirit. You brought us from non existence into existence, and when we fell, you again raised us up to heaven and bestowed on us your kingdom which is to come. For all this we thank you, and your only begotten Son and your Holy Spirit. For all which we know and all which we do not know, for your benefits manifested and concealed, which have been done for us. We thank you for this liturgical service, which you deign to accept from our hands. Though before you stand thousands of archangels, and tens of thousands of angels, the many-eyed cherubim, and the six-winged seraphim, who in flying soar high. Singing the triumphant hymns, shouting aloud, crying out, and proclaiming. Amen. Holy, 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 Amen. Lord of Sabaoth, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed she comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. With these blessed powers, O Master and Lover of humankind, we also shout out and proclaim, You are holy.
for communion with your Holy Spirit, for fulfillment of the kingdom of heaven, for confidence towards you, but not for judgment or condemnation. Again, we offer you the spiritual sacrifice for those fallen asleep in the faith. Forefathers, fathers, patriarchs, prophets, apostles, preachers, evangelists, martyrs, confessors, ascetics, and every righteous spirit made perfect in faith. My
and the gift of the Holy Spirit, let us pray to the Lord. together with us, 
and by your mighty hand condescend to impart to us your most pure body and precious blood and through us to all the people. O God, cleanse me a sinner and have mercy on me. Let us attend. Holy feelings are for the holy. One is holy, one is Lord Jesus Christ, the glory of God the Father of men. The Lamb of God is broken and distributed, broken but not divided, and never eaten, and never consumed, sanctified all those who partake of it. of the cup which lay in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed is the first of your saints, always now and ever into the age of the age. Play it skillfully with a shout. 
cup of joy for the work of the Lord is right and all his works is dark and true. Rejoice in the Lord.
serve you, God, James. We see the fish of your body, whatever, Lord, God, we see the we serve you, God, Alexander. We see the fish of your body, whatever, Lord, God, we see the fish of your body, whatever, Lord, God, we see the fish of your body, whatever, Lord, Oh, 
of your departed servant Stanislav, O Christ our God, and to you we send our glory with your eternal Father, with your all holy, good, and life giving Spirit, now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. The choir of saints has found the source of life and the door of paradise. May I too find a way through repentance. I am the lost sheep, call me back, O Savior, and save me. Slava was to his sin, is yet on the book, in in ye e prismo be ki de poba habi. Hail, O honored one, who bore God in the flesh for the salvation of all. Through you, the human race has found salvation. Through you, may we find paradise, O pure and blessed Mother of God. Alleluia, 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 slava te vie gospodi. Alleluia, 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 slava te vie boge. Alleluia, 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 glory to thee, O God. Again and again in peace, let us pray to the Lord. Again we pray for the repose of the soul and departed servant of God, Stanislav, and that he may be pardoned in all his sins. Whether committed voluntarily or involuntarily, Gospodi pomiluj, Gospodi pomiluj, Gospodi pomiluj. That the Lord God will assign His soul with the just repose. Gospodi pomiluj, Gospodi pomiluj, Gospodi pomiluj. For the mercies of God, the kingdom of heaven, the forgiveness of transgressions. Let us ask of Christ, our Lord and King and our God, for thy was for thee. For you are the resurrection, the life, and the repose of your departed servant, Stanislav, O Christ our God. And you we send of glory, together with your eternal Father, your only good and life giving spirit, now and ever, and to the ages of ages. With your saints give rest, O Christ. Through the soul of your servant, place it where there is no suffering, no sorrow, no sighing, but life everlasting. You alone are mortal, you who made and molded man. But we mortals were formed from earth, and to the earth we return. As you who created me commanded and said to me, You are earth, and to the earth you shall return, where all we mortals are wending our way. And for a funeral dirge we make the song, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. So me Jedina čista je na prošlja djevo, 
meat or warm-blooded animal products like dairy and eggs to the best you can during this two-week period. The Dormition fast goes all the way from now until two weeks from now on a Saturday, but two weeks from now exactly is that is the actual feast day, which is not a fast day, on the 15th of August. On that day, we'll be celebrating the Dormition, the Most Holy Mother of God, a major feast day of our church year. Please note that also the last Sunday of August will also be a feast day. It's unusual, but it's, a, it's the day commemorating the beheading of John the Baptist. And that's a strict fast day for Orthodox Christians. It rarely falls on a Sunday, but this year it will. So we'll have to watch our calendar and avoid bringing meat on that day also and dairy products. As you can see, we resumed serving indoors. We resumed our agave pot like luncheons. And as of now, the California State and County Health Authorities here in the Bay Area still do not require vaccinated people to wear face, mask, face masks or maintain social distancing indoors. However, because of the Delta variant, which is far more contagious than the original COVID-19 virus, and because cases are spiking, especially among the unvaccinated, um, they're recommending that we wear masks indoors when it's suitable. I, I myself now have, have resumed wearing masks when I go shopping, uh, primarily because I don't want to become a carrier. Those who are vaccinated, uh, it's, it's proven that they are less likely to have any serious or life-threatening uh, problems from this virus. But this variant apparently is very contagious, more contagious than the common cold. And even those of us who are vaccinated can carry, carry not even knowing so, and pass it on to others like uh, much more vulnerable unvaccinated people. So we need to all be careful. Here at the monastery, I don't plan to wear masks indoors, but again, when I go shopping in large areas with lots of people, I have to resume wearing a mask. Um, so we'll watch. It's quite possible they may go back to make it uh, mandated, but so far it's not, it's not required. And I was in Costco just this last week, and they were serving samples. And Costco is very good to stuff this thing, so I think we can have samples upstairs. With you. Uh, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today is actually the first day of the Dormition Fast. It's also a day when we commemorate the Maccabean martyrs, this wonderful, heroic Jewish family who lived just 150 years before our Lord was born who stood up to the pagan Hellenists who were trying to destroy the Mosaic law in Judaism. And the mother watched all seven of her sons be martyred, and she herself was, died from grief. And their teacher, Eliezer, was also martyred. But as for the revolt of Judas Maccabeus, who ended up winning and preserving Judaism and defeating the Hellenistic forces of Antiochus, who was a successor to Alexander the Great, who was ruling Syria and Palestine at the time. He even brought in the statue of Zeus into the Jewish temple. So it was a very trying time for the Jewish people in preparation for our Lord's birth, coming of the Messiah. And they are considered very, very important martyrs in the Orthodox Christian Church. Today is also the procession of the Venerable Cross. More specifically, the procession of the honorable wood of the life-giving cross of the Lord. It's the first of three feasts of the Savior this month. This is the procession of the Holy Cross. It's one of the Holy Cross days of the year. The sixth is the Transfiguration of our Lord. And the day after Dormition, when we commemorate the icon not made by human hands, like our flag here at the monastery, that's considered the third great feast of our Lord this month. In the Portologium, which is the Book of Hours, the Chasoslov or Chasovu in Romanian, of 1897 in Greek, we find out where this feast came from. It reads that because of the illnesses that occur in August, it was customary in former times to carry the venerable wood of the cross 
through the streets and squares of Constantinople for the sanctification of the city and for relief from sickness for the people. And on the eve, which would have been last, last night, July 31st, it was taken out of the imperial treasury and laid upon the altar of the great church of Hagia Sophia, the church of the wisdom of God dedicated to Christ. So from this feast day, August 1st, until August 14th, the day before the dormition of our Most Holy Mother of God, it was taken out of the imperial treasury, carried in processions, set for veneration in several churches of Constantinople, and laid upon the altar of the great church of Hagia Sophia. In the Russian church, this feast also has special meaning for them because it's also a remembrance of the baptism of Rus, which took place on August 1st, 988. In the account of the order of services in the Holy Orthodox Catholic and Apostolic Great Church of the Dormition, compiled in 1627 by order of Patriarch Philaret of Moscow and all Rus, there is the following explanation of the feast. On the day of the procession of the Venerable Cross, there is a church procession for the sanctification of water and for the enlightenment of the people throughout all the towns and places where they inhabit. Knowledge of the day of the actual baptism of Rus is preserved in the Chronicles of the 16th century, where we read that the baptism of the great prince Vladimir of Kiev in all Rus took place on August 1st. But remember that in Constantinople, this procession was made with the actual cross. Not just a cross, but the cross. What happened to the cross of our Lord after the Empress St. Helen discovered it in her archaeological expedition in Jerusalem at the beginning of the 4th century after the legalization of Christianity? She discovered the cross of our Savior, the two crosses of the thieves, and she also found the cave where our Lord was born in Bethlehem. And she built churches and all on both those places and other places of the Holy Land. St. Ambrose of Milan, who wrote at the end of the fourth century, says the cross was divided and distributed in thirds. One third for Rome, one-third for Constantinople, New Rome, and one-third for the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. According to pious tradition, the size of the cross of Christ was 15 feet in height and 8 feet wide. St. Kirill of Jerusalem, writing in the 4th century, tells us the whole world has now been filled with pieces of the wood of the cross. So little slivers were already being distributed throughout the Christianized Roman Empire. And he makes this statement no less than three times in his lectures to the catechumens in Jerusalem during Lent when he's teaching them about the faith as they prepare for baptism on Holy Saturday. St. John Chrysostom in the same century tells us that fragments of the true cross were kept in golden reliquaries which men reverently wore upon their persons. In 1889, two French archaeologists discovered in the district of Sétif an inscription of the year 359 in which, among other relics, is mentioned the sacred wood of the cross. Other inscriptions elsewhere point to mentions of relics of the cross in churches throughout the empire. St. Paulinus of Nola in the 5th century established many monasteries in the Western Empire, sent to Sobicius Severus a fragment of the true cross with these words, Receive a great gift in a little compass and take in this almost atomic segment of a short dart, an armament against the perils 
of the present and a pledge of everlasting safety and salvation. Around 455, Yuvenali, Patriarch of Jerusalem, sent to Pope St. Leo a fragment of the precious wood. Later, St. Hilary, under the Emperor Symmachus, we are again told that fragments of the true cross were being enclosed in altars in Gaul. In about the year 500, Abitus, Bishop of Vienne in France, asked for a portion of the cross from the Patriarch of Jerusalem. So, relics of the cross were being distributed everywhere. But again, the three largest portions were in Rome and put in the Church of the Holy Cross, built by the Empress Helen herself in the 4th century, a third in Constantinople, and a third in the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. But the origins and rubrics for the celebration of the current feast of the procession of the cross among Christians of the East Roman Empire, Constantinople, are explained in a wonderful article by Holger Klein called The Sacred Relics and Imperial Ceremonies at the Great Palace of Constantinople. He writes that the Persian invasion of Syria and Palestine in 614 and the, era, and the subsequent Muslim Arab conquest of Jerusalem in 637-38 resulted in important transfers of relics during the reign of the Emperor Heraclius, who reigned from 610 to 41. It changed Constantinople's status into the greatest repository of sacred relics in the Christian world for centuries. In the Chronicle on Pascal, we find out that the relic of the Holy Lance, the sponge, and the true cross from Jerusalem were recovered from the Persians, who took it as a war trophy back to Ptestephon, modern-day Iraq. And during 629, the Emperor Heraclius recovered it, and he brought it back to Constantinople and exhibited it for public veneration in the Church of Hagia Sophia, for several days before he took it to Jerusalem back to the Holy Sepulcher. And on the 21st of March the following year he exalted it in a great ceremony. But then just very soon afterwards the Muslim Arabs conquered Jerusalem. And the empire unexpectedly lost this holy city again. And for safekeeping, it was necessitated that the major part of the relic of the Holy Cross in Jerusalem was brought to Constantinople for safekeeping, where it was now safeguarded by the emperor himself and kept inside the confines of the imperial palace. The forced relocation of the larger part of the relic of the True Cross from Jerusalem to Constantinople greatly enhanced the importance and prestige of the city and the Emperor's role as the guardian and protector of Christianity's most sacred treasure. A smaller portion of the relic associated with Constantine the Great had already been set in a bejeweled processional cross and was being used in imperial processions in the beginning of the 6th century, even before this. It's known that it preceded the imperial armies that marched out in military campaigns to defend the Christian Empire during the reign of the Emperor Maurice. But it was the transfer of this larger part of the true cross from Jerusalem that effectively transformed Constantinople into a new Jerusalem and more than just a political capital. And it turned the imperial palace into a holy place at the heart of the Christianized East Roman Empire. The procession of the true cross not only reinforced the emperor's divine mandate 
but also rendered him the most important distributor of relics of the true cross throughout the whole Christian world. A position future emperors would eagerly exploit for political purposes sometimes in building political alliances with Christian rulers in Western Europe. Where the relic of the true cross in Jerusalem was originally kept cannot be determined with certainty. In the second half of the 7th century, we have information from a Latin bishop, Bishop Arkuf, visiting Constantinople from the west on his way back from a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And he mentions a portion of the relic was, at least for the time of its public veneration during Holy Week, kept inside Hagia Sophia in a very large and beautiful chest to the north of the interior of the building. Sometimes people take Arcus' testimony as an indication that the main relic of the true cross by that time was being entrusted to the care of the patriarch. But judging from later accounts, it's more likely that the relic of the true cross in Jerusalem and the so-called cross of Constantine were both safeguarded inside the imperial palace, presumably in what was called the Schemophilachion, the, the, the treasury the Holy Treasury, and removed only temporarily for specific liturgical and ceremonial functions. The Emperor Constantine VII Porphyrogenitus wrote a book called the Book of Ceremonies in the 10th century, and he gives us much information about the relics. He says they were still kept in the Schemophilacion of the Imperial Palace and were taken out on special feasts and occasions. One such feast was a six-day long festival celebrated in the middle of Lent, which we still celebrate to this day in the Orthodox Church on the third Sunday of Lent, when it was taken out for public display and veneration by the people inside the Cathedral of Hagia Sophia, and a related imperial ceremony performed in the palace. According to the Book of Ceremonies, celebrations started on the third Sunday of Lent, just as we do today. It describes that three glorious pieces of the cross, so actually three large pieces of the cross, were removed from the treasury and taken to the Nea Ecclesia, the new church, to be venerated by all. After Matins Utrenia Orthros was concluded, they were taken to the gallery of the church, where the clergies of both the Imperial Palace and the new church intoned the true party of the crucifixion, and people were allowed to venerate the cross. At this time, the emperor and his co-emperors were given the opportunity to venerate and kiss the precious relics. And then the three pieces of the cross were separated and taken in processions throughout the city so that they might bring blessings on all the people. And the clergy who carried them, some went to the church of the, the new church. A second large fragment of the cross was taken by the palace clergy to the church of St. Stephen where also his relics had been transferred from Jerusalem. And they carried it in festive procession for veneration by members of the Senate of Constantinople. And the cross was then taken to the church of the proto martyr Stephen in the Daphne Palace, where it remained overnight. On the following day, the clergy took the relic to Hagia Sophia, where it was displayed for veneration by the faithful for all during the next week. The third section of the cross never left the gallery of the new church. But after the ninth hour on Friday, when public venerations had ended at Hagia Sophia, the clergy brought the crosses back to the palace. So we get this feeling of being there in Constantinople on the sacred period for the procession of the Holy Cross when it was carried out. The life-giving cross of the Lord was shared for blessings among all the people of God. In three processions throughout the major streets and plazas of the city. 
not only in the spring, but it also happened for two weeks, beginning on August 1st, which is the present procession of the Holy Cross. The cross was taken to the Church of St. Stephen, carried through all the neighborhoods of the capital to, quote, cleanse and sanctify all places and houses of the God-guarded and imperial city, and not only the buildings, but also the walls of the city to protect it from barbarian invasions and its suburbs. And when the relic returned from its journey on August 13th, the clergy took the relic through the rooms of the imperial palace to cleanse and sanctify them as well. And then the relic was kept in the oratory of St. Theodore before it was carried back to the Church of the Virgin of the Faros, of the Lighthouse after Vespers. Here the relic was received by the Skevophilax, who protected the, che the treasurer of the palace, and returned to the treasury. In the tradition in which I was raised in Protestantism, you know, relics are not even mentioned. Relics are nothing important. But we know from the very, very early centuries of Christianity, from the Acts of the Martyrs, that Christians who saw their brothers and sisters martyred in the arena would gather up their remains, whatever they could save, even though the pagans oftentimes burned them so there wouldn't be anything left for the Christians, or threw them into rivers so they couldn't be retrieved. But the Christian brothers and sisters treasured their heroes who stood up for Christ, who would not deny Christ, and died for Christ. And they gathered their remains, their relics. And they buried them in special holy places, whether in the catacombs, underneath the city of Rome, or elsewhere. In the countryside, they would erect a small canopy, much like we see over our outdoor altar. And they would call it a, a martyrium, a place of witness. And every year they would come on the anniversary of the martyrdom of their brothers and sisters to pray for them and to ask these martyrs to pray for them. Between the church militant here on earth, still struggling, and the church triumphant in heaven, already with Christ. This is the origin of the church calendar. This is why we have saints' days. Almost every saints' day is the day of their martyrdom, the day of their falling asleep in the Lord the day of their spiritual birthday. And so it is with the cross. We Orthodox Christians believe in sanctified matter. We believe that God, God the Father's only begotten Son, became incarnate, became one of us to sanctify matter. And that's how we're saved, by being part of the God-man. And everything sanctified by him, those who died for him, those who receive his body and blood, those who receive his holy mysteries and the sacraments, those who live godly and pleasing lives. All of our matter is sanctified, not just our soul, but matter itself. And so it is that we treasure relics. And here at Holy Cross Monastery, we do not have many relics, but we do have two mighty relics, small though they be, and one is a sliver of the cross and one is a tiny fragment of bone of St. Nicholas, acquired for us by God-loving founding abbot Archimedes Theodore during his trips to Italy, when they had the audience with the Pope of Rome in the 1960s with the Archbishop of America for the Syrian Orthodox Church. It was right after the 67th War, and the Pope was anxious to make bonds with the Christians in the Holy Land. And Father Theodore made inquiries and was able to get these two relics for us. And it's our custom here at the monastery to bless you with the relic of the cross on feasts of the Holy Cross and with a fragment of the relic of St. Nicholas on his feast days. So please, as you come forward, instead of the regular blessing cross, we'll be blessing you with the relic of the Holy Cross. Thank you, Father.
please have your right hand cupped over your left so you see the hold your breath. We're still taking precautions, best of my hand. Oh, I forgot, I forgot. The Chantelenko family, I meant to announce this, um, very dear to us. The Chantelenko family came to us just a few years ago, but it was love at first sight, and they made a spiritual home here, and they've just been inseparable from the monastery since that time. And But circumstances are such that they're going to be moving, and this is their last Sunday here. It was for Yelena's father that we prayed today. So I would just like to, holding the relic of the cross in my hand, to intone that God blesses them in this new chapter of their life and watches over them. So we say, Grant, O Lord, peace, health, and long life to the members of the Chatelenko family, Vladimir, Yelena, Valentin, Constantine, and Alexandra, grand and many and happy years. No Gaia no Gaia no Gaia Thank you. 